Hello and welcome to today's webinar from the Phil Fisher Silicon Valley team. Today we're going to be talking about AI integration and third party risk management. Um, this is actually our last webinar of 2023. We really hope you've had uh, a great year and a very productive year. Also, um, we hope that you've enjoyed some of our webinars over the course of the last 12 months. If you have any feedback on sessions you've attended over the past 12 months, or if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover next year, any burning ideas or suggestions, then please let us know, drop us an email, or slide into our DMs on LinkedIn. We're always grateful and interested to get the feedback, so please let us know. Um, some quick introductions. My name is Richard Lorne. I'm a senior associate at Phil Fisher and based here in our Palo Alto office. Today I'm joined by my boss and US managing partner Mark Weber and also a rising star in our team at Pardeep Denoya. So as mentioned, today the topic for the webinar is AI integration. And it goes without saying that we've seen an absolute explosion over the past year and more in the pace and breadth of AI adoption to the point now where AI is powering an almost limitless range of applications across industries and sectors, whether that's enhancing customer service through intelligent virtual assistants, or maybe turbocharging predictive maintenance in manufacturing, or propelling data-driven decision-making in finance. And this, set, this trend is only set to continue over the next year. And in fact, just on there, in their view, NVIDIA predicts that 2024, the theme will all be about creating partnerships and collaborations around AI, including with cloud service providers, data storage and analytics companies, and other partners who have the know-how, how to handle, fine tune and deploy AI effectively. But of course, adopting new technology and AI also means taking on new risks whether that's organizational risks, commercial risks, legal risks, or reputational risks. So a crucial part of any AI strategy is gonna be managing and dealing with third-party risks. So what we'll be thinking about today is how do you approach third-party risk management in the context of AI? What processes, policies, and measures have you got in place to help identify, assess, and manage those risks? And here, we're not just talking about data, we're thinking about the broader range of issues and risks, challenges um, that any organization needs to consider when you are adopting and integrating AI. And one key point, and perhaps uh, the main takeaway will hopefully leave you with, is that AI may be novel, it may be complex and involve unique risks and challenges. But ultimately, when we're thinking about third party AI, we're also talking about supply chain issues. So really, some of this boils down to how you approach uh, vendor and third-party tool procurement and uh, what policies and processes you have in place from a supply chain perspective. Separately, we'd also be remiss not to mention the big announcement from last week that the EU has finally agreed the provisional text of the AI Act. That certainly got a lot of coverage in the news and on LinkedIn. And you may be wondering what impact that regulation is going to have when it comes into uh, force in a couple of years time. Well, as product safety legislation, a major focus of the act is around misc risk management. And for technology applications that actually fall within the scope of that law, and principally that's going to be the limited number of high risk applications, this is going to involves specific risk management requirements for providers and harmonized standards for AI risk management. So what we're going to be talking about today isn't specifically geared to the AI Act, but it really does follow that principle and laying the foundation for addressing risk management. So with that said, I'm now going to hand over Mark, who's going to uh, explain a little bit more about what we mean when we're talking about AI integration. Thank you, Richard. Um, and uh, uh, this slide on licensing, integrating or building AI really goes to the heart of why we're running this webinar. We see a lot of confusion when we're talking to some clients. And um, you know, in part, that's because there's an enormous amount of market commentary, as Richard has just been showing us, all around AI use and AI projects and what AI can deliver. However, you know, Although AI is sexy and topical, 
ultimately it is just software and when we use the word ai it's also relatively you know, meaningless because it's talking about a type of software and a type of software procurement and on the basis not I, all ai is the same therefore not all ai projects are the same and as richard was beginning to intimate we really see a number of different product uh, projects but then also some different approaches depending on those projects. And this slide really represents the, the three core types of project we're seeing. Um, and as the AI market continues to evolve, we've done a lot of the build, the train, and the, the, the put onto the market work for our clients out here in Silicon Valley. It's not just the last 12 months, it's been a number of years where clients have been either working on machine learning or analytics or training models. Those models are starting to proliferate and they're starting to be used. And when they proliferate and when they're used, the first model we see here on the left is a simple licensing model, or it could be an outright buy, but that's you know, relatively rare in that most vendors are putting something on the market, issuing a license. Um, but essentially in a licensing model, a third party has built that AI. They've decided how to go and go and build it. Um, they make available that AI under license. That license is essentially a permission. And the user wants to make use of that AI within its own business. So a simple license and use model in the, in the, in the first instance. And we'll talk to that because what, you know, what is a license? Well, you're buying something. What is buying? That is a simple supply chain issue or sometimes not the simple supply chain issue. Then in the middle here, we've got the concept of integration. You know, the theme of a lot of this session. A third party has developed an AI model and gone and trained it they make it available under license, but that license allows a level of distribution or integration. The user, often our customer, but not always, wants to use that AI to integrate it into its own technology and put it on a market as a combined product for other users to use and enjoy. That AI is being integrated, put alongside other software, maybe even put alongside other AI and put onto the market for use. Um, and then you've got the build. Um, the client is developing its own AI model, um, whether inter for internal use or for sale or licensing on one of the, you know, the prior two models. And we're not really here to take about talk about build today. We run our webinars on build. Um, we're here to focus on the licensing and the integration. And with that licensing and integration, that could be off the shelf i.e. you use the AI as it is and the model without any further development, or it could be extended platform in that you're taking a model and then training and building and building on an existing model with your own data, your own data sets, um, and, and essentially developing a, a hybrid of that AI. Now, in both the license and the integration projects, you're not responsible for that underlying model or the original training you need to consider the AI project in quite a different way and with a different perspective, and often with a different perspective to a lot of the commentary we're seeing out there on the internet and out there in, uh, in webinars, because so many people are assuming that you're building and developing and responsible for the underlying AI model. But that simply isn't the case in many instances, and it won't be the case in many, many instances going forward. So if you aren't responsible for building that model, you don't know what data was trained and what's put into the the underlying um, the underlying development and how it was tested. Um, you haven't been able to test for bias or discrimination or work out how well um, the the AI model performs. You're dependent on a vendor to answer those kinds of questions, uh, to explain the model, to explain the training data, to explain its reliability, its safety, and any fairness considerations. All of things which matter to you as a user, all of things which matter to you even more if you're integrating that technology and putting it on the market yourself in combination with things that you've built or, or, or within your own wrapper. And it's very different kind of AI product where the, um, to an AI project where you've built and trained the AI yourself. And that's why we wanted to focus on this because essentially what we're talking about is a supply chain question. I'm buying technology, software in the case of AI, off someone else and what do I need to do in order to assess that, to consider my risk and to move ahead with an active product. Um, so let's kind of move along and think about this in the context of a supply chain and I'll uh, hand over to Pardeet to talk a little more. 
Oh, Actually, yes, this one's this one's mine. So before we talk um, more about what those issues uh, involve and some of the key things you'll need to think about, we're just going to provide an example of what an AI supply chain might look like. And actually, the Centre for European Policy Studies <clears throat> has identified seven basic configurations making up AI supply chains. They may contain one, two, three or more developers and suppliers, and there's a range of different orders of complexity. Um, and naturally, across those seven basic configurations, there may be an infinite variety of other variations. However, we're just going to stick with one example for now and look at one slice of what an AI supply chain involves. So this is an example from the healthcare industry, which is one of the biggest adopters of AI technology. Here we have at the heart of the supply chain, which is the patient, and they are needing medical diagnosis, um, and they are therefore going to the hospital for diagnosis and treatment. Now, the hospital, they, the user or the customer of technology to help provide that patient care. So perhaps they are looking at using an AI-powered uh, diagnostics tool, which is provided by a medtech developer. And that tool potentially performs different tasks, in both, including analyzing medical imaging, perhaps to detect early signs of a disease like cancer. So that technology may integrate a number of different features, including scanning and analytics tools, but perhaps it also includes a voice-enabled interface for the medical practitioner. So further upstream, the medtech developer also relies on the services of another third-party voice recognition developer, and they provide an essential component of the technology that complements the diagnostic tool, a, an LLP processing that captures and converts the doctor's verbal assessments, instructions, and commands into text. So here we really have a technology that is the fusion of different visual and textual um, technologies that are gonna help enrich diagnostic tool and pr help provide a comprehensive uh, diagnostics for the hospital and ultimately um, um, a tool to help care for the, the patient. So within this supply chain, you know, first of all, we're thinking about the hospital as the customer and user of technology, and it's going to have in place a contract with its provider, the medtech developer. Further upstream in the chain, equally, we have a contract in place between the medtech developer and its own provider here, the NLP or voice recognition developer. So we have a number of different agreements in place, but also across this supply chain, we also are thinking about the data flows. So at the point of data collection, we have the patient and that input data is going to flow upstream to the hospital, onwards to the medtech developer, and then ultimately to the voice recognition developer. Um, and similarly, the output of some of these tools and processes is going to flow in the other direction downstream. So the output of the voice recognition developer is going to flow downstream back to the hospital. So what's important about this is to consider in its role as the customer or the user, the hospital has to evaluate particular risks of the technology and the use case. Um, ultimately, it may not have been involved in actually developing, designing that tool. It may not have had any control over how the technology was developed, but it is ultimately the user of that tool and it has a responsibility to the patient and other stakeholders involved. So from the hospital's perspective, it's going to be needing to think about its procurement processes, um, and that involves considering where it's situated within that supply chain and who's sitting further upstream. So that's just one example. And obviously, uh, in the real, real world, there's going to be uh, many more varieties and more layers of complexity involved. I'll now hand over to Pardeep, who's going to kick us off with some of the key questions you're going to need to think about in any uh, AI supply chain. Cool, thanks Richard. So there are some key questions that you will need to consider when thinking about integrating AI within your organization. The first one is, where do you sit within the supply chain? Are you the end user? Are you the customer of the AI tool? Or do you sit further upstream within the supply chain and are in fact incorporating a third party AI technology? within your own products and services that will be used by others. 
it is really important to understand who else is also involved within the supply chain. For example, it might be a case where the AI solution provider has developed the model or the AI solution is using a third party model and there are other third parties that you will need to consider within that supply chain. So you might be involved in a simple supply chain or you might be involved in a more com complex supply chain where there are multiple providers and you're trying to figure out who ultimately will be accountable for evaluating and mitigating those different risks. The second question is, what are the potential risks for your organization and others? You will need to identify and understand what the particular risks are for a certain use case. For example, are there IP and copyright infringement risks? Is there any risks about the accuracy of AI outputs? Are your employees concerned about AI potentially replacing some of their work tasks? Are there concerns about lack of transparency, security, or how and why the AI system came to certain decisions? Some other risks might be whether users are clearly informed that they are actually inter integrating and interacting with an AI system. For example, an AI chatbot or a recommendation tool where these particular tools might seem to be human-like. Another question to consider is, what level of control and assurances do you have? So a key issue to consider is what level of control do you have around the development of the AI and around its use? And what assurances are you able to obtain from third party developers? For example, consider what control do you have over the training the model? Do you know what training data was used? Do you know if this was an off the shelf third party model or was it a fine tuned model? So it might seem that AI integration is a bit like buying something, but you're actually getting a bit limited assurances in response. For example, in the medical supply chain example that Rich provided earlier, the hospital is responsible for the life of the patient, but you will need to consider, can the hospital provide assurances from the medtech provider about the accuracy of any results? You will need to essentially obtain contractual assurances from AI developers as to the capabilities and performance of the AI technology. Another key question to consider is who actually contributes to AI risk management within your organization? It is best to consider who in the organization will be involved in risk management. And there might be different stakeholders, such as within your legal department, procurement, security, and potentially even within your leadership team. AI risk management is not limited to one department, and it's likely that the organization is going to require input and collaboration across different departments of the organization. You, you might have to consider who has a skill set within the organization to manage risk, who is going to be involved in integration, who is going to be involved in post deployment process. Finally, what processes will help you identify, mitigate and manage risks? You might need to think about what internal policies, procedures and measures you have in place to address risk management. For example, whether there's vendor procurement measures, any risk and impact assessments, any internal governance frameworks. You might want to develop an AI knowledge hub or maybe consider preparing a library of te terminology use cases or preparing a user guide. I'll now, hand over you to, I'll now hand over to Mark to discuss AI integration lifecycle in more detail. Thank you, Pardeep. So um, that was really helpful. And Pardeep has just you know, you know, given a great explanation of those key questions. And in particular, one of her first questions was, where do you sit in the supply chain? You know, having that understanding of uh, the, uh, you know, just one of the examples which uh, Richard was talking through. Um, you need to build that understanding of the structure and the risks, because if you don't understand the structure, you can't think about the risks. And if you don't understand your risks, you can't think about how to address them and deploy and use safe AI. So all AI has a product life cycle. And an awful lot of what we see uh, online in the commentary really goes to that development life cycle, assuming that you are responsible for the building and training of their AI. But of course, you know, in this situation, we're focusing in on licensing and integration. We're not necessarily building and training their AI. There's actually a different life cycle. And we've got an example of an integration life cycle above, but even that is a bit of a hybrid example of that integration life cycle, because we're really focusing on the legal elements 
um, that we would consider from a supply chain perspective, not necessarily the technical and, uh, and, and, and safety and trust issues that you might also be considering. So thinking about the AI integration lifecycle, because we're talking about the things that you need to consider if you're uh, integrating other AI, um, you know, essentially a team would go out at the very beginning, identify a prospective AI solution. More often than not in the last year, that has been uh, uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT, but now we're seeing many others out there on the market and other choices that may be you know, a vendor I NDA, a confidentiality undertakings, you know, just to start uh, yeah, discussions with that vendor. There may be a complete you know, AI solution due diligence looking into that AI. What does it do? How does it perform? Some of that will be technical. Some of that will be you know, questions about integration and coding and compatibility. Some would be about capacity management. And, uh, and various kind of technical solutions, and some of which also need to be legal. And we'll talk about that in a, in a couple of moments with, a, with, a, with an overview from, uh, from Richard. Um, but then, you know, essentially, once you've done your due diligence, you need to think about the impact. What does it mean for me using that AI? So completing an AI impact assessment would be one of our recommendations. Again, because that's such an important step, we'll come on talking about that. Um, that AI impact assessment will be allowing you to think about the use of AI, what risks are involved, maybe their legal risks, maybe their risks to rights, maybe their risks to, uh, to IP or, or to, to reputation, but then also how you address and minimize and mitigate against those risks, all in a proportionate way, depending on what you're, uh, you're evaluating. Once you've understood those risks and you understand how you deploy and you've made a go, no go decision, you'll probably enter into a contract. In the case of integration, that's probably gonna be a licensing agreement permitting you to use the model for certain purposes and integrate it and then potentially make that model available. Quite a lot to think about there. I think we would really caution against entering into that contract before you've completed certainly steps three, four and five before it. Then, of course, record management, you want to keep an idea of what IA you're deploying, from whom, and where it comes. And as we'll come on to, to talk about right at the end of this session, some post-integration measures, more about what you need to think about once it's been put onto market and your ongoing responsibility. So as a lawyer, you need to be aware of this life cycle, aware of the kind of questions and organizational and supply chain issues you might ask. But also, you need to be aware that, you know, the, it's not an ideal world. Not everyone will join this integration life cycle at step one, and you may be parachuted in at any stage, and you might need to look back and think and recognize the issues that are appropriate to address at that stage, whether there's an ability to look back and whether time permits, and then also recognize that there could probably be different stakeholders that you're working with at different stages within this integration. And each stage presents different legal issues and sometimes some significant activities. And that's why we're gonna go and talk about particularly stage three, because it's very hard to integrate if you haven't performed the level of due diligence. So uh, Richard, over to you to think a little bit about that. Thanks, Mark. So absolutely, due diligence is a core aspect of any risk management process. And here we're not just talking about third party vendor due diligence, we're thinking a little bit more broadly in terms of solution due diligence. Um, in the context of the fact that an AI tool may involve multiple different vendors and stakeholders. So we're thinking here more holistically about the AI solution. This slide outlines some of the key steps to consider when you're thinking about due diligence, and let's dive in. So the top one, capabilities and limitations. So any exercise in due diligence should begin by understanding what the AI solution actually does, what it can do, and just as importantly, what it can't do. So assessing its functionality, the technology stack, and how it actually addresses your current needs. Also understanding the boundaries of its capabilities and ensuring uh, that in whole it aligns with your expectations and requirements. Second is all about the data, training, validation, and testing. You should scrutinize the data that has been used to develop the AI. What data is actually used to test, train, and validate the model? And what are the sources of data? Was the data proprietary, publicly available, licensed from a third party? And in fact, were you involved in contributing any of that data? For example, in terms of fine tuning. 
So the source and nature of training and validation data can significantly influence the performance of the AI in terms of accuracy, quality, and relevance. And therefore, you need to think about whether the data was appropriate, whether it was representative. Um, and these types of questions may inform also how the AI will perform in real world scenarios and applications. Also related to thinking about the provenance of the data and the development of the model, issues around potential IP issues or data protection concerns resulting from those data, salts, data sets. Moving down the list, third, we're looking at testing and quality assurance, which is really linked to um, the second step, but thinking more broadly about what testing is actually being performed on the solution, including in controlled environments. So this is a verification about the AI's performance, its stability, its accuracy, its reliability, and rigorous testing is needed to identify any potential flaws, areas of improvement and risks before full scale and real world deployment. And if actually you don't have the capabilities in the testing, or perhaps you weren't involved in the development and testing uh, stage of the life cycle, then this includes uh, performing due diligence from the vendor and obtaining information um, quality controls and assurances around what testing has been performed. Fourth, we're talking a lot about supply chains today, and so this is a key one, supply chain dependencies, understanding all of the different actors involved in the supply chain and the different components and services that the AI solution actually depends on, and evaluating whether there are any key risks that stick out within those supply chain. So that might include sources of data, it could be hardware, it could be software components, um, but it could include a range of different de dependencies that fit, sit further upstream within the supply chain. And naturally, thinking about dependencies is going to be more important if the AI is performing important or critical tasks and functions. Fifth on our list is compliance with standards. So does the solution actually adhere to any um, industry or technical standards that can perhaps um, demonstrate a level of compliance? Um, and that may include particular security standards, such as encryption protocols, or it could include independent audits. Um, and it could include some of the emerging AI frameworks and standards that we've seen being developed over the past few years and many more, no doubt, are to come. Sixth on our list, we have privacy and security. So this is perhaps meriting its own separate review in terms of whether there are any particular issues and risks from a data protection and privacy um, aspect. Um, and what um, privacy uh, models and considerations have been taken into account during the development of the solution. And again, what security uh, measures have been implemented by any of the vendors involved. And lastly on our list, we have guidelines for use. So has the, uh, so the provider that you're working with, have they actually developed any guidelines for use in terms of um, operational procedures, user training and escalation paths when it actually comes to integrating and day-to-day -day use of the AI tool? So this is a non-exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that you need to be thinking about from a due diligence perspective. And now I am handing over to, I think to Pardee. Yes, yes that's right. That's right yeah. um, and we're gonna be thinking more about AI impact assessments. Cool, thanks Richard. So what is an AI impact assessment? Just like the GDPR where controllers are required to carry out DPIAs for high risk processing, an AI impact assessment is a way to demonstrate accountability and benchmark the way the particular AI solution evolves within your organization. So there's really no right or wrong way of doing this. It's likely that multiple stakeholders will be involved in preparing an AI impact assessment than they would be for a DPIA. And the depth of assessment might depend on the risks involved within the AI solution. At Fieldfisher Silicon Valley, we have prepared a starting point for an AI impact assessment to really help our clients evaluate the system's benefits and risks. An AI impact assessment is designed to achieve five different goals. 
Firstly, it will help to capture an AI system's risk by identifying the severity of each risk factor and enabling the organization to properly balance the benefits and risks relating to a specific AI system. For example, a simple workflow autom automation project is likely to create fewer potential risks than using a biometric facial recognition system. And it's really important to understand that no risk is essentially the same. For example, a tool which analyzes financial markets where there's possibly no personal data involved is likely to have less risks than a employee monitoring tool where sensitive data might be involved. Secondly, an AI impact assessment will help to cover full development life cycle requirements. And the AI impact assessment should encompass a deep dive into the AI system and how it operates. So you will consider questions such as what data was used for model development? Are there any ongoing training issues, any issues related to deployment and ongoing operation, and whether any further governance documentation is required? Thirdly, you will need to assess, it will help to assess impact and increase accountability through a multi-stakeholder analysis. So a successful AI impact assessment should engage a broad range of internal stakeholders, but also in possibly include external representatives, such as an ethics or data review board. Fourthly, it will help to facilitate goal or no goal decisions. So the AI impact assessment will help to set out the reasoning and conclusion behind whether the AI system is ready to be integrated or whether it should be redesigned or whether it should be withdrawn completely from your organization. And you might conclude that there's not necessarily a no goal for the entire AI integration project, and it might involve limiting and identifying certain um, guardrails and limits that you might want to place around the use of the tool. Lastly, the AI impact assessment will help to record and track certain risks, and it will help to track your organization's decisions and thought process on the AI system, and it, it will help to um, ensure that this document is reviewed and updated periodically, and it will provide an evidence and a trail of what was agreed within your organization. So overall, the AI impact assessment will help to evaluate the ethical, legal, and social implications of using AI within your organization. And it's important to note that it's not enough to just identify risks. You will also need to identify actionable mitigating steps within the AI impact assessment. I will now hand over to Mark to discuss post-integration and ongoing responsibilities next. Thank you, Pardeep. Um, yeah, really interesting. And I think we're finding incredible value from those AI impact assessments because it just builds layers of thought um, in, in relation to that implementation and you know, eventually the final, you know, the final launch and putting that AI either onto the market or you know, putting it live within an integrated product. Um, but once it has gone live, you're going to continue to follow up on those actionable and risk mitigating steps and tasks that you've identified. We've evaluated, we've signed a contract, perhaps got commitments, perhaps then integrated, made that AI available, but the issues and responsibility don't end. And I think this is one of the big learnings from AI integration uh, that we're seeing. And one of the things that I think many businesses just simply aren't equipped to do. And our real message is don't be blind like Leo the dog here. Um, with a towel on your head, um, in, you know, all may be well and you may be insulated from the outside world, but you're really not you know, paying attention to what's going on. And our message is that post-integration, once that uh, so the, the, the AI is live and the model is operational, there are things to do. Um, and there are ongoing things to do. It may be around audit. Um, you may have identified certain risks that require, require a level of human review or input or to, to minimize, you know, maybe there's automated decision-making and you're relying on not having automated decision because there's decision-making, because there's a level of human review. Is that maintained? Another important and yeah, absolutely critical thing that we see time and time again is scope creep. The whole assessment, the awareness, putting onto the market was all evaluated for one particular use, one particular data set or one particular part of the business. And suddenly others are using it for new, you know, and unanticipated purposes. That scope creep may materially change your view of, uh, 
of, of all that uh, the, 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 uh, that happens um, in relation to to the AI and and of the and, and of the risks involved. And also, you want to be checking in on performance. Is the AI really performing in the way it was on day one? We're beginning to read quite a lot about degradation of certain models as AI is trained on AI output. Um, and uh, and the, as, as models don't necessarily hold up in the way uh, that we thought they would. So yeah, you know, spotting that and spotting goes to awareness, being aware of vendor messages. If your vendor has provided your product, you know, are they telling you information about how you do thing, how to use it, things to use, upgrades you need to do, patches or implementations or new functionality uh, that you need to do. Are they you know varying the product you originally bought? And it's another form of scope creep. Are you aware of, um, you know, you bought a simple product and now it's a more complicated product. It may be single modal and now it's multimodal and you hadn't assessed the use of images or you hadn't assessed the use of voice uh, when previously the whole original assessment had only been on the use of text. So that multimodal increase is exciting for the business, but, uh, you know, being aware of what is being used, what is being put on the market and safe and good use around that. Another kind of awareness is you know, good use by your users, whether they're your own internal people because you put it on uh, uh, with, within your own systems or whether it's uh, with the external users who are you know, using your integrated product. You know, what are the intended purposes of this product? What shouldn't it be used for? Are there, guide, uh, guide, sorry, are there guidelines, you know, acceptable use policies, other guardrails around that use? You know, or boundaries beyond which it wouldn't or shouldn't be used. You know, we often see that with software. You know, historically, don't use it for emergency services. Don't use it for critical circumstances. Exactly the same things would apply. You shouldn't necessarily be using your chatbot when you're out on lunch to run your nuclear power station. But uh, you know, it's an unintended use, and it's a you know fairly far-fetched and fanciful one. But these things can happen, and there can be implications if you're not aware. Of how things work and that goes on to monitoring and monitoring of performance is the ai doing what you expected are the outputs accurate are there any changes in the outputs is that there is an evolving bias is there any new or emerging safety issues you need to see and you know have you thought about incident management what if it does go wrong have you got a protocol to turn the thing off to well, know how to turn it off, to unintegrate. What are the consequences of turning it on for those who are off, for those who are relying on it? And you know, it, you know, it could be that kind of incident management needs to be, you know, needs to evolve and be bought, built into your typical security incident or your data breach reporting practices. Is that something that you've even considered? And then importantly, who does this? Who's responsible? Who's keeping an eye out? If you're on the legal team, chances are you sign the contract, you move on but somebody in the business needs to own it and need to be responsible. And if others see problems or experience problems because of the auditing awareness or monitoring that's taking place, how can they escalate that to appropriate people within the organization and decision makers so something happens and, and something actually gets done when uh, a problem or a development or a change is detected. So an awful lot there. And the sort of thing that we don't tend to think about except in very critical so, yeah, solutions. A lot of AI licensing that we get from third parties at the moment is here it is, here's how you use it, disclaim, disclaim, disclaim. There isn't that ongoing support, there isn't the ongoing you know, maintenance, and maybe they're the kind of things that we'll see you know, much the same way as we did as outsourcings or other third party procurement activities involved. You know, how do we you know, how do we manage incidents? How do we manage change? How do we manage regulatory change? What if we don't want to use this product anymore and we can't turn it off? Do we have a exit plan? Do we have a way of rolling out? Do we have a way of, way of clawing back our data or things that we've built within that model or changing APIs in order to integrate and seamlessly put in something else? There's a, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to think about uh, as lawyers which go beyond the traditional and um, you know, go beyond the initial life cycle issues of you know, assessing and putting that integrated product on the market in the first place so yeah an awful lot there um but um yeah those key elements of the integrated supply chain or the integration supply chain we've kind of called out the due diligence that richard's talked about the ai assessment that uh, and, and practices that pardeep talked about and then post integration so i'll leave it to to richard to kind of come up and summarize some best practices and a few takeaways for you as we uh, as we come to the end of some of this 
Thank you, Mark. Yeah, we thought we'd wrap up today's webinar with some best practices for AI integration. And on this slide, we've anchored this around three principles, which we like to call the three P's of risk management, prioritization, proportionality, and preparation. So the first principle is around prioritizing, both in terms of the benefits and risks of AI. Which AI applications will drive the most significant benefits for the business and the organization? Which initiatives deserve priority in terms of resources and strategic focus. But equally, what are the biggest and most important risks in any particular use case? Not all risks weigh equally, we know that, and this may require allocating more attention and resources to the risks that matter the most. So prioritization is fundamentally important. Secondly, proportionality. This is about calibrating your approach to the level of risk presented. For example, an AI system used for automating routine document sorting poses very different types of risks and the level of risk compared to an AI that makes credit decisions or impacts whether a user has access to financial resourcing. So the latter example may require a heavier hand in terms of regulatory compliance and transparency than the former. That goes without saying. Proportionality should guide your approach to risk management and governments and oversight mechanisms to make sure that uh, we're addressing the most important risks and um, managing uh, resources and time appropriately. Lastly, preparation. So we've talked a lot today about due diligence, risk assessment, but also post-integration deployment. What is your readiness plan for integrating the AI? This is beyond you know, legal considerations, but also thinking about um, how the AI solution is actually going to be adopted and used. Does that require training for users and employees? And does it also mean making sure you're prepared for contingencies, well thought out incident response plans, protocols for dealing with AI related decisions? Um, preparation is key to ensuring that you're not only ready to leverage AI's capabilities, but also to manage any risks or challenges that arise. So we think these three core principles serve as a blueprint for AI integration and really help you make sure that uh, your response is well matched to the risks and that you are better positioned to help exploit the advantages of AI while managing some of the potential risks. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much, Richard. This is um, yeah, clearly the biggest takeaway. There is no one size fits all. You can't just pick up a single risk management framework and make it work. You've got to think. And uh, you know, I think that prioritization, proportionality and preparation and recognizing what you do on this integration may be very different to what you do on the, the next is, uh, is very key. So look, thank you very much for attending uh, today. We did want to uh, uh, point out um, we've got another webinar coming up, um, a, a DSA uh, session which goes live next next year on the 9th of January um, and um, you know, look forward to um, yeah, nine o'clock uh, PT and look forward to some of you, you know, coming up and uh, attending that. You know, the DSA, the EU's Digital Services Act will you know, be less than two months away at that point or almost a month away at that point. So those of you who have not thought and those of you who have not prepared, we're just giving you a little bit of a nudge to get ready for that. But uh, um, sorry again for, for some of you. Um, I, we had a slide issue at the beginning and I seem to have another slide issue at the moment. Um, and I'm not sure why I'm getting that. But um, let's see how I can um, um, uh, how I can deal. But uh, um, we'll, yeah, here we go. So there's my DSA um, yeah, it's kind of prompt. Um, just to remind you, we've got our Field Fisher Data Protection blog. All of our videos and uh, webinars are made available on our Silicon Valley YouTube channel, including this one. Uh, those of you who have registered for attendee attendance will get a link to that, as well as a uh, copy out of the, uh, the slides if you want them. And also, we've got a, a few more bite-sized digital podcasts addressing, addressing particular issues, usually 10-minute insights into things topical for the day that's available on apple podcasts spotify and google podcasts 
different to these more detailed webinars, but also proving very interesting. And uh, I think a number of you have said how much you appreciated that small bite size and topical insight. So look out for that, um, if not just for your you know, cure uh, for insomnia or whatever, whatever else you're thinking about late at night. Um, but we, um, we thank you very much for, for attending. And um, if you have uh, any kind of questions or interest going forward, then, then please reach out. But thank you very much to Party and to Richard uh, for this session. And uh, we wish everybody well with the rest of the day, wherever you are in the world. So thank you very much.